Two issues tonight. Let's start with the price of oil. You saw how it closed today, below 70 bucks a barrel. Just look at this. Since July, it's dropped almost 35 percent. That's a plummet. And for a country rich in oil, one assumes it's a problem. Even though oil prices keep slipping, Ottawa claims it has all these drops factored in. Not so Newfoundland. They're now scrambling to halt certain spending. In Saskatchewan, their budget was projected with $94 oil. Now they're hoping good potash prices and the sale of crown lands will neutralize the oil drop. Alberta, where 25% of all revenue comes from oil, the government says tough decisions are on the way. So this is getting serious and the impact can quickly spill over from the economy to political planning. Andrew is in San Diego tonight. Chantel is in Montreal. Bruce is in Ottawa. We did talk about this about a a month or so ago, but that was back when it was around $80 a barrel. Now we're into the 60s. And I know the normal cautions should take place here that, you know, prices fluctuate. But this is getting pretty serious, one assumes. Bruce, you're probably closest to the oil business. What's your take on it? Well, I do think that this is a really important economic uh, event, an economic trend, and, and it is going to be one that's going to cause bigger and bigger problems or challenges for the country if the price continues to stay low and if, in fact, it goes lower still. I, I do think that um, the impact on a lot of projects will be a little bit muted by the fact that um, as prices are coming down, uh, some of the costs associated with development are coming down as well, and our currency is declining too. There are there are bad downsides to some of that, but it means that our projects, that many of our projects don't um, come under such extreme duress that they have to shut down as quickly as one might think. That having been said, the point that you were making, Peter, about all of the other spillover effects on the economy, on provincial and, and in some respects federal treasuries as well, uh, those are important. There are lots of Canadians who work in industries that uh, contribute to energy development uh, in different parts of the country. And I think that it won't be long with prices at this level before we start to see some impacts there. Uh, and so hopefully for folks who are affected that way that we see some uh, improvement in prices. Chantel, what's your take? Well, uh, everything that Bruce said is true. It's mostly true for energy pro uh, producing provinces though. Uh, we have a diverse economy. Uh, sometimes the interest of one region are not the same as the interest of other regions. A low dollar, for instance, helps Ontario and Quebec, uh, where uh, the majority of the population at this juncture live. So yes, there are challenges for energy producing provinces, but there might be opportunities for more growth for the provinces like Quebec and Ontario. I suspect that uh, the economic mantra of the government is going to have to be tweaked. Uh, a lot of the way that Stephen Harper has talked about the economy has been uh, emphasizing, you know, Canada as an energy superpower. That is still true, but uh, the, a, a, a more balanced message would be that the, the country is more diverse. We're not just about oil and gas. Andrew. I think it really does depend on how long this, uh, this happens. If you look at the futures markets, they're pricing oil to return to about $80 about three, four years out from now. The question is, what happens in the interim? Does it go back up there in the next few months or does it stay down here for the next year or two? If it's just a few months, uh, particularly in the current fiscal year, I actually don't think there's that much impact on governments. They were pricing oil, remember, at $95 at the beginning of the year. It, it rose up to 110 for several months and now it's come down. So averaging out, it's not that far off where they were originally forecasting. But in years out, certainly for those provincial governments, there's going to be a hit. The federal level, I actually do think they've priced in about $70 oil into their forecast. It means they use up all of their contingency, the $3 billion contingency reserve, but that's what it's there for, for these kinds of um, somewhat unforeseen events. But if you're looking at an Alberta, if this price stays where it is, uh, yeah, they're taking maybe a billion or two out of their revenues. That hurts much more for them than it does uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the government of Canada. And I think you're starting to see a conversation in Alberta about how do we insulate ourselves at, at the, at, as a government against these kind of wild swings in revenues. And of course, the issue that's staring them in the face that nobody ever wants to address is a sales tax. If you have a sales tax of, you could get about a billion dollars for each point of, if, you, if you piggybacked on the GST, uh, you could take five points of, of sales tax and that would relieve, a, you know, take, a, take a great deal of the pressure off of your oil revenues. And you could use any windfall gains from the oil revenues if, if prices do go back up to 
to pay down debt or to invest in infrastructure. That's the obvious solution, but you're not going to get a conversation going in Alberta about no, that. No, no, I don't think you will. That would be a... <laughs> it would take, Hello it would to take all my a, Alberta friends. <laughs> it would take a really brave provincial government. Remember what happened to the federal government that introduced the GST, what happened to most governments that raised the GST. So this is kind of an iconic uh, issue. I think you would possibly uh, want to do it at the beginning of a mandate and probably having mentioned it in your campaign. Yeah. <laughs> well, you might not get a beginning of a mandate if you mention it. I know, it in but campaign. it might be the only way is to say we need to do this and please give me a mandate. Otherwise, you'd be dead uh, after right. a year or after three years, yeah. right? Remember 18 cents a gallon? Mm. Joe Clark, that worked really well. Um, mm. I don't see things exactly the same way that Chantal does in terms of the the regional economic dynamics and the political consequences. And I'd like, if I can, Peter, just to return to that briefly. I do think that if we see a, a persistence of these conditions and a worsening of the economic rents uh, payable to governments um, and more apprehension about how well the economy is going to function, because, of course, the Bank of Canada has done the math that says GDP across the country uh, suffers if, uh, if, our, uh, if our energy sector suffers. I think that's going to bring consequences not just for Stephen Harper, but for the other party leaders as well. It's going to draw them out, force them to come out a little bit more and defend their alternative visions of things like pipelines or uh, economic strategies, or in fact, get a little closer to the position that the government has been taking about the importance of these projects. Uh, Andrew, give us your thought on that, on the political impact, the potential political impact of this. Well, Bruce is right that the country as a whole benefited from oil prices going up and they will hurt as a whole from prices going down. But there's no doubt there's also a regional dist distribution of that. And uh, in, in a way, it will reduce some of the tension, some of the interregional rivalries that had start, started to open up when, when Alberta was really riding high. Uh, I don't wish, uh, you know, misfortune on anybody, but, the, but one consequence of this is that, is that there'll be less of that interregional tension, interregional envies. We're certainly not going to hear much talk about Dutch disease anymore from Mr. Mulcair. And I also think it, it, in a way, puts more emphasis on trying to get the pipeline going. If the overall price of oil is going to be lower than it was, then that makes it even more important that we reduce even further the premium between the price that, that, that the world price and the price that Canada is getting. And that's what a lot of this pipeline is about, is to try and diversify our markets, get out of this captivity of the U.S. market, and try and close that differential. So in a way, it, it almost uh, increases the interest for people to try and find ways to get at least one of these pipelines built. Okay, got to get to issue two, and Chantal, I'll get you to start us on it first, but let me remind everybody of, of these quotes from last night. Peter Goldring is an Alberta Conservative MP. Uh, he kind of waded into this, well, not kind of, he waded into the uh, harassment uh, debate that's been going on amongst MPs in Ottawa. With this press release last night, and this is part of it, MPs must learn, as I have, from encounters with authority figures in the past that all do not tell the truth. I now wear protection in the form of body-worn video recording equipment. Well, that didn't sit too well with a, a number of people, not just the opposition parties, but the Prime Minister's office, who got Goldring within hours to put out this press release. Earlier today, I issued a press release that I now recognize was completely inappropriate. I retract that press release unconditionally and deeply regret it. In fact, the PMO, even before he got that release out, was putting the word out that it was unacceptable and they were trying to distance themselves from it. Uh, damage control very quickly. What do you take from it all, Chantal? Well, first, that uh, the Conservatives, if you've noticed, have uh, been trying to stay out of the debate that, that the Liberals and the NDP have been having over sexual harassment and MP versus MP. But second, that they did not want to be defined in any way, shape or form by what you could qualify as kind of a bozo uh, characterization of the issue. Uh, so rather than just say this MP doesn't speak for us, he's a backbencher, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, I think they moved really swiftly because they know, as we probably all know as journalists or broadcasters, that this issue uh, is not only an issue that has captured a lot of interest in the public, but it has been very significant to women. Uh, and the last thing that the Conservatives want to look is insensitive on the issue of sexual harassment on the eve of an election. Bruce? Well, Peter, you said that uh, Mr. Goldring waded into this debate. It was more like he belly flopped into it. I do think the, uh, 
I agree with everything that Chantel said in this particular instance, of course, he, that, that the Conservatives knew instantly uh, that this intervention, if it was left to stand on the record for any length of time, was going to see them drawn into this debate, which they had heretofore been successfully avoiding, uh, and drawn in uh, around a comment that is far from the comment that they would have wanted to utter had they been willing to get involved in this in any way, shape, or form, which they weren't. Well, you wonder, even though it was out for a couple of hours before they, they, they got it pulled back, that it does last forever. These things last forever. That uh, the image of you know some MP going around with a you know a camera strapped to his body, or a, I think he was said he had a camera in his pen or something. But I, I mean, it's hard to lose that even with a retraction, Andrew. Well, it's obviously an asinine comment. To be fair to him, he seems to have been conflating this issue with his own difficulties with the law in which he views himself as being unjustly accused. But it was a silly uh, comment, and I can imagine the embarrassment and mortification uh, in the Prime Minister's office. However, uh, I really bristle with this business of Prime Minister's office stuffing words in MPs' mouths. Everybody might cheer here because we're, you know, we, we don't think much of the comment. But remember, this was the same thing done to David Wilkes when he complained about uh, the omnibus budget bill. He was made to retract that and to say he'd always, he'd never had any problem with it. And by the way, Eurasia had always been at war with the Oceania, etc. Um, the more that you do that, the more that indeed. Um, people are going to start associating you, the PMO or the party leader, with those bozo eruptions with individual MPs. But if you stop doing that, if you say, look, individual MPs are going to say their, their piece, and some of them are going to be well judged, and some of them are going to be ill judged, but they're MPs who are accountable to their constituents and to their riding associations and in extremists to the caucus, then that's one thing. But the more that you intervene this way, the more that you say every word that comes out of an MP's mouth, well judged or ill judged, is somehow the responsibility of the leader's office, then you just get into this you know, worse and worse loop where you wind up intervening in everything. You know, we talk a good game, we in the press, about how we want more MPs to have more autonomy. But every time an issue like this comes up, we seem to run back to, oh, why doesn't the leader do something? The leader is not their employer. He's not their boss. We need, need to rethink this model. Uh, I would just take issue with the notion of cheering, explaining why the PMO moved doesn't imply cheering uh, for the PMO doing something. In this I didn't instance, mean to imply that, I'm sorry. No, but uh, in this instance, I would also think that it won't stick for the very reason that journalists on Parliament Hill know who is a member of the Conservative caucus. They know that this is not a frontline minister. This is someone who is speaking his mind, who's probably off the grid totally. Uh, so I don't think it's going to stick to the government. But I think, and here is where I disagree with Andrew, I think at this point, if they just let it ride, uh, it would have defined what the government had to say because they said precious little else about right. the issue. I, I have no objection if the, if the Prime Minister's office said we strongly denounce this, we have no use for this comment, etc. I have no problem with that. But forcing him to recant and read out a, a you know, pre-written script for him, I just think crosses a line that didn't need to be crossed. All right. We've got to leave it at that. Good discussion, though. Thank you all. Enjoy San Diego, Andrew. Thank you. Montreal is uh, home base for Chantel, of course, and Ottawa for Bruce. Thank you.